Buona giornata. Good morning. We are in the second session of the third. Perhaps it's better to say the third because yesterday we have had two sessions. And today we have two uh, presentations, one of Professor Patrick Bernard and the other of Professor Chaim Sadun. Professor Patrick Bernard is uh, working in uh, the Trinity College of Dublin, Dublin, yes? Um, at the moment it's Potsdam, Germany. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. And uh, he developed the uh, analysis, cultural analysis, social and political transformation, and crossovers and exchanges that took place between European and extra-European societies. I saw that you wrote also on uh, the persecutions in, in North Africa during the war, before the war, and so you have, uh, you are very close with our session today. I will thank you for your presentations. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this uh, very kind introduction. And it's my special thanks go to uh, Chaim and Tamar for having invited me to this uh, conference. It's, uh, for me, it's kind of coming home because I used to live in Rome for four years. So getting a little bit nostalgic today. Um, yeah. Um, what I will present today will probably not be completely new to you. You're all uh, experts in the field, but I think uh, in the way I present the material and try to provide a different reading, this will be hopefully new and uh, in a way innovative. Um, um, especially what, what the basic idea of my talk will be uh, is to try to show that we cannot understand uh, the wartime persecution of Jews without taking into account the previous years, the, the, war, uh, the peace period, and especially the colonial context in which these uh, um, crimes um, happened. Uh, and I understand colonial in the widest possible sense. Um, to this day, indeed, um, there is no consensus on what fascism and anti-Semitism meant for fascist Italy. While some scholars consider the persecution of the Jews to be of secondary importance, sorry, I, I forgot, I have a PowerPoint. Yeah. And you will see, by the way, you will see uh, not only slides, but uh, pictures as well. Um, I will even talk about architecture and will show you some uh, pictures. Okay, just to go back, while some scholars consider the persecution of the Jews to be of secondary importance to the regime in Rome and motivated by little more than a desire to make uh, strategic concessions to its mighty Axis partner Germany, for others, Italy's violent policies of exclusion were a manifestation of the racist nature of fascism and thus reflective of its true essence. The second uh, school of thought has emphasized how Italian persecution of Jews and other ostensibly inferior races was carried out independently from Germany and often in conflict with Nazi racial policies. Looking specifically at North Africa as an example, I would propose a third and a past revisionist uh, reading of this history. When persecuting local Jews in Libya and Tunisia, Italian authorities were neither subordinate to the Germans nor did they act in complete isolation from them. Rather, despite numerous points of difference and conflicts, Axis relations in North Africa during World War II were marked by mutual exchange and cooperation 
uh, uh, based on a shared worldview when it came to anti-Semitism. In a final analysis, racism was by no means just an aspect of difference between the two regimes, but was actually also an element of interconnection, I will argue. Uh, and my argument has two parts. In the first part, um, I will deal with instances in which the Germans borrowed from the Italians before the war broke out in Africa in September 1940, and this learning prepared the ground uh, for future collaboration between uh, the main Axis partners. I will argue that right from its beginning, the Nazi regime took a special interest in the fascist biopolitics that were being developed for application in Italy's new empire, especially its program of racial segregation. Indeed, in the late 1930s, German authorities were considering deporting racially undesirables to Africa Italiana, thus using the colonies of its main access partner to purify the Volksgemeinschaft or national community. Um, and the second part, you see that here, um, deals uh, with the war period. Um, I will show that exchange and learning were mutual and based on a shared racial worldview. No? After 1940, anti-Semitic organizational structures and practices were transferred from Nazi-occupied Europe to Africa. In Tunisia, and you, some of you might know that, German and Italian authorities installed so-called Jewish councils charged, just like in Poland, with organizing the forced labor of Jewish men. This was, um, as far as I know, uh, unique to the history of Italian fascism. Nowhere else under fascist occupation did authorities take such far-reaching measures. Okay, let's start with the first point. Um, if there was a topic fascist Italy and Nazi Germany agreed upon, then it was the idea of empire. Both regimes repeatedly identified empire building as a vital sign of a nation's health. As more recent research has shown, there was a close link between violent foreign expansionism and the domestic politics of racial regeneration and rejuvenation. Empires were to provide the necessary living space, as it was called at the time, for millions of settlers who, in turn, would improve the race, and uh, this means both in quantitative and qualitative terms. Yet, there were not only considerable similarities between the two main fascist regimes, we can also see ideological crossovers and process of emulation south and north of the Alps. It is important to know that for many years it was fascist Italy that inspired and I would argue paved the way uh, for the imperial policies of Nazi Germany. And I think this is less astonishing than one might think. Mussolini first took power in Italy in 1922, creating Europe's first fascist dictatorship. The Italian fascists had a head start of no less than 11 years on the Nazis and to a considerable extent uh, set the benchmark, so to say, for a successful right-wing dictatorship. Indeed, when using the term totalitarianism, no, this is what uh, Ruth ben Giat has told us, for a long time people did not refer to Nazism and communism, but to Mussolini's regime as Bolshevism's enemy twin. To many in Europe and beyond, fascist Italy seemed to provide good solutions to the problems posed by modernity. And what made fascist Italy to German eyes so attractive was its versatility. It could be referred to in a variety of ways. Indeed, the polyvalent meaning it was given is key explanation for its success. Basically, the Italian colonial empire acquired three different meanings for Nazi Germany. Firstly, Mussolini's policy of conquest was a significant driver of colonial desires within German society. And you know, Germany at that time had already lost its colonies. Italian expansionism seemed to demonstrate that the German dream of empire was not necessarily over, that the country could perhaps still obtain its place in the sun. Secondly, the Nazi leadership was able to profit from this colonial enthusiasm. Even though Hitler clearly favored Eastern European over African possessions, no, that's something you probably all know, he realized that he could use, he could use Italian colonialism as a means 
for advertising his own visions of imperial conquest, especially in Eastern Europe. And thirdly, and this is the most interesting point here, fascist Italy's colonial empire served both as a model for their settlement policies and dumping ground for the racially undesirables when the Nazis started to develop far-reaching plans for a future German empire in Africa and Eastern Europe. In the following, I will focus on the last aspect. No, this is, I think, the, the most relevant to our conference. And as I will argue here, um, the extensive plans made by the Nazi state for future German empire in Africa and Eastern Europe borrowed heavily from the Italian experiences in Abyssinia and Libya. The Nazis emulated numerous Italian policies, including racist uh, methods of population control and police repression, as well as bureaucratic structures needed to manage the new colonial territories. And I will be very brief here. Um, I would just highlight um, a few aspects. Beginning in 1933 and with increasing intensity after the spring uh, of 1940, the Nazi regime developed very detailed plans for a German Middle Africa or Middle Africa that was to include, among others, the former German East Africa, the Belgian Congo, the French Senegal, as well as Madagascar. Italian colonialism was inspirational because many Nazi officials did not want to rely on German colonial experiences when planning future colonies. Uh, rather, they wanted to break with their own country's traditions as the simple reinstatement of former German colonial rule was seen as not feasible. Many years had passed since the country had lost its overseas possessions as an official uh, of, um, of the Reich explained. It was thus necessary to bring the country's colonial archive up to date by studying the methods other European powers were now applying in their colonies. In this context, Mussolini's regime was said to be of, and I quote, particular importance. What distinguished Italian colonial route to German eyes from that of other European countries was that it developed its territories in the spirit of the fascist idea. A strong inspiration for Nazi Germany was in particular the strict stance the Italian took in race relations. These are all quotations. Mussolini's regime had introduced laws prohibiting racial mixing and severely punished any transgressions of the color line. Italian colonialism in Africa informed German planning in three different areas, in its overarching settlement policies, in its conception of future colonial infrastructure, no roads, for instance, and its approach to racist population management. And a striking example here is the apartheid system Mussolini's regime applied to overseas possessions to segregate indigenous people from um, the nationals or so-called nationals. And the numerous new towns, and um, uh, please forgive me for those who know this story uh, better than me, and the numerous new towns um, the fascists built in East Africa, there were quarters established exclusively for Italians and for Ethiopians, buffered by a neutral zone consisting of official buildings and public facilities such as schools, administrative buildings, movie theaters, medical facilities, hotels, and party offices. Thus, there was a clear racist vision behind fascist city planning. Cities were designed to prevent the superior, the allegedly superior Italian stock from being contaminated by inferior Africans. Even though, even though the Italians did not always manage to enforce their apartheid system, the German colonial planning staff was fascinated, still fascinated by Italy's efforts. As an official um, of the Nazi party's colonial office, explained in 1942 in a lengthy memo, an apartheid system was essential for reasons of racial policy. It was stated that this was a good means of preserving the integrity of the Aryan race. And this is the very same official that designed a one-to-one -one copy, I would argue, of the Italian layout for such a town. Um, and then I think here, um, the role model character of um, fascist Italy becomes manifest. What you can see here are two plans on the left hand. Um, this is a plan for uh, a German city in middle Africa. And on the right, you see uh, the city map of Adama. This is uh, a city cent uh, in central Ethiopia, 60 miles southeast 
of Addis Ababa. In both schemes, we find the same well-defined quarters for nationals, and uh, you see that in red, quarters for natives, yeah, um, in green, and the neutral zones with public facilities in black in between them now to prevent um, the um, intimate contacts between um, the two people. Um, and this process of learning did not remain limited to the colonial sphere in the more traditional sense, but also influenced German empire building in Eastern Europe. And here you see um, um, uh, another slide that gives you at least um, a short clue of what do I mean. Yeah, you see that the idea of the fascist piazza as a central social hub for the new settlers uh, traveled from Libya via Berlin and Rome as far as Poland. Yeah? These both, both these settlements were actually built yeah, and still exist. Um, finally, um, the Italian colonies were not just a model uh, when it came to settling German colonists. Now, so this is, the, let's say, the, the, the more positive aspect of um, fascist biopolitics. Um, um, there's also a much more sinister part. Um, they were also seen as possible dumping ground for those deemed racially in undesirables in Nazi Germany. Starting in 1937, Nazi authorities developed plans to deport black Germans and Jews to Abyssinia. And here you see another picture um, 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 above. Um, this is the official German propaganda uh, and translated in Italian, it would mean La Mezzogna della Razza. And below you see two pictures of two, two black German children that were um, concerned with this policy of ex social exclusion. Um, these kids were descendants of um, black African French soldiers and uh, white German mothers, no, the, the black German, uh, the black African soldiers were at that time stationed in, uh, in Germany, yeah? uh, part of Germany was occupied uh, after the First World War by um, the Entente powers and about 400 of these children existed and um, um, the idea was to actually, you know, to take them from their families and deport them to Abyssinia. And Germany um, at that time hoped to join similar programs. Fascist Italy was developing for its colonies in order to get rid of the Jews living in mainland Italy. This means that Madagascar was not the only place the Nazis thought of as a super ghetto before they took the decision in favor of the Holocaust. That's what Nazi Germany did was that it tried in a way to export the so-called Jewish problem by making use of the overseas territories of its most important ally. It was probably only because Mussolini dropped the Abyssinian plan in the late 1930s that Germany focused on other options it had developed simultaneously. And um, yeah, this exchange of ideas, yeah, and I think this is uh, really um, a very sinister uh, um, uh, aspect of transnational history this exchange of ideas across fascist borders rested upon a network of personal and institutional ties. A good example is the contacts that Heinrich Himmler and his Italian counterpart Arturo Bocchini established in the field of colonial policing. The relations included, among other things, uh, the training of some 400, 400 officers of the German police and SS in the academy of the Italian colonial police in Tivoli, no? near Rome. After being taught in colonial geography, tropical hygiene, and race relations, some of these men were later deployed to Libya, where they served as some sort of liaison officers uh, between uh, the security forces um, of the two regimes. And the most uh, renowned being Theo Sevike. I think m some of you know him. Michele Safati probably can tell us a little bit more about his role in the occupation of Italy after 1943. Okay, let's start with the second part uh, of my talk. It was these ties upon cooperation between Germans and Italians would rest in Libya during the Desert War when Jews became the subject of massive anti-Semitic persecution by the fascist regime. 
as the events after 1940 clearly show the Italians and Germans both learned from each other in a mutual process of exchange. Indeed, despite constant quarrels over the operation of the war and growing German contempt for the allegedly poor fighting ability of the Italians, now this is something that became uh, very much talked about, even proverbial, to a certain degree, Italians still collaborated with and learned from the Germans when it came to dealing with the local Jewish population. In this context, I will highlight just two aspects that I believe are particularly relevant for our conference. The first aspect um, concerns the occupation of Libya. And let me be um, very clear here on where I think the Italians actually learned from the Germans and where they did not. Yeah, we will also we have to talk also about not learning. I argued that the Italian anti-Semitic policies in Libya were not simply the result of the growing German pressure in the country in the sense that Mussolini's regime gave in only half-heartedly to please its Axis partner whose presence in Libya was felt more and more after the arrival of, Lommel, of Rommel's Africa Corps in February 1941. Admittedly, Libya, where Germans and Italians fought side by side, saw ruthless policies of anti-Semitic persecution. Indeed, the situation in Libya differed, I would argue, from that witnessed in other states under the control of the Italian fascist regime, including Slovenia, Greece, and parts of Croatia. As I have argued elsewhere, fascist plans to persecute Jews in North Africa went beyond the action taken in Italy itself and in the European territories occupied by the Italian army. And most disturbing, I would argue, is the fact that from spring 1942 onward, when the Italian authorities set up concentration camps in the Libyan desert to intern the entire Jewish population. Huh? We're talking here about 30,000 people the lives of many Jews were at risk and many actually died. To be sure, in mainland Italy proper, Jews were also interned in camps, yet in none of these camps was the mortality rate as high as it was in the one in Jado. However, it would be incorrect to assume that Italy's brutal anti-Semitic policies in Libya were due to the growing German presence in the country. Indeed, I have not found a single document that supports this idea. Rather, it appears that the persecution of Jews in Libya was shaped and driven by two factors. And this is A, the fascist regime's genuinely anti-Semitic mindset, and B, the colonial context, the colonial context in which these policies of repression took place. As a closer look at the sources reveals, leading representatives of the Italian party and state bureaucracy explained and justified the radicalization of anti-Semitic persecution in Libya by claiming it was necessary to combat the Jewish plutocratic world conspiracy. In the Libyan case, this idea fix was closely linked to the wartime events in North Africa. The fact that Jews had supported the British enemy was widely perceived as proof of an all-encompassing plot against fascism and one of its most prestigious project, and that is the creation of a new racial empire. Furthermore, what rendered the persecution of the North African Jews so easy for Mussolini's state was in all likelihood the fact that many of them were of color or were considered to be of color. And this, I think, uh, marks the, um, a striking contrast to the case of the Italian and Croatian Jews, for, for instance. It was thus perhaps logical in the regime's terms to apply to Libyan Jews the same repressive measures that were applied to Arabs and Berbers uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. Insofar as this is true, we can conclude that colonialism did not water down uh, fascist rule, as has often been claimed, but on the contrary, um, uh, it was one of its major drivers. Acknowledging that fascist Italy carried out its policies of anti-Semitic persecution in Libya in a largely independent fashion does not mean, however, that there were no instances in which the Italians learned or collaborated with the German authorities. Indeed, there were numerous cases of exchange and cooperation. In this way, it is important for us to recognize that the two regimes freely and voluntarily exchange information, learning from one another. 
It was precisely because fascist Italy shared numerous racial and anti-Semitic ideas with the, its German ally that it was interested in its techniques and instruments of repression. Thus, my studies differ from previous scholarly accounts concerning the motives. I think this is the, um, the key here, the motives of learning and cooperation. I argue that the persecution of Libyan Jews was not a consequence of Mussolini's opportunistic policy vis-a-vis -vis Germany, but was grounded in a racist and anti-Semitic worldview. As instances of violence against Jews suggest local Jews, this anti-Semitic worldview did not remain limited to the upper echelons of the fascist state and party, but rather permeated various segments of Italian society. And as Rachel Simon has shown for the North African case, in the later phase of the war in Libya, Italian soldiers, often in collaboration with their comrades from the Africa Corps, um, harassed Jews, insulted them, and tried to force their way into their houses. There were various cases of robbery reported, as well as recorded cases of rape, which uh, appeared to have been targeted at Jewish women, because they were Jewish. Um, these crimes mainly occurred during the final withdrawal of the Axis um, forces to Tunisia, and it seems to have been the result of a desire for revenge, no vendetta due to the Axis defeat, the crushing Axis defeat at El Alamein. I think we should not forget that this defeat meant, really meant the end of Italy's dreams of conquest and empire. Um, it is possible that German-Italian collaboration in matters related to the persecution of Jews even went a step further. Thus, the local chief of the Italian colonial police, Ugo Presti, handed over a list with the numbers of Jews living in Libya to German authorities in October 1942. I think this, is, um, this event is of great importance since the Wannsee Conference, which had taken place only a few months prior to this conversation in January 1942, Heydrich and his men were making efforts to obtain reliable information about the numbers of Jews living in the areas ruled by the Axis powers. And here you have a transcript um, of the report that details a little bit of uh, this yeah, very strange Italo-German consultations, and I would just briefly read that. Please find attached a list of the remaining Jews in Libya and their geographical distribution. The general of the Italian police, Presti, who was so kind to provide it to me, has asked me to treat the list with discretion. Yeah, and you see um, it's, quite, it's quite detailed, and as far as I know, um, the numbers are fairly correct. Um, I think future research will have to um, determine whether fascist Italy deliberately, deliberately helped to register people that the Germans were already planning to kill at that time. As Götz Ali and Karl-Heinz Roth asserted some time ago, collecting statistical information about Jewish population was the first step along this pathway, not the pathway that led to um, Auschwitz. If this suspicion were to be confirmed, it will show that Africa, along with Europe, was indeed within the sphere of uh, the Holocaust. And I think that's something we should discuss later on, because uh, I had the impression there's also um, quite considerable resistance um, against such um, a narrative. Yeah? Uh, Dan Michmann took a very decisive stance in this question. The second aspect that I would like to deal with um, is the German and Italian occupation of Tunisia. Yeah? Um, um, in, in Tunisia, um, both uh, powers established a short-lived yet very brutal uh, anti-Semitic uh, regime that took place um, in this country. It was in Tunisia that the Italian occupation authorities adopted German organizational structures of anti-Semitic repression. They created a Jewish council, uh, the Judenrat in Tunis, modeled on the German example. The German occupation authorities had installed a Jewish council uh, a short time earlier, which was intended to facilitate, yeah, no, just repeat that, facilitate the organization of Jewish forced labor. The Germans transferred their earlier experiences with the exploitation of Jewish individuals in France and Eastern Europe to Africa. And one of those who brought anti-Semitic expertise to North Africa was Rudolf Rahn, who had helped run 
the German occupation regime in France. And just to give you another uh, picture um, of what I found. Um, um, so this is the way uh, German propaganda at the time, and we're talking here about uh, the Wehrmacht propaganda, um, depicted um, Jewish people at that time. And uh, if you have a closer look, you even see some sort of preliminary st uh, star of David Batch, yeah? Actually, um, um, it was in, in a way, it must have been introduced in uh, Tunisia, despite claims that it wasn't. Um, yeah, and um, what is so striking about the case in Tunisia is that the Italian occupying authorities made immediate use of st this outside knowledge resource and similarly set up a Jewish council and with its help organized forced labor by Tunisian Jews. And uh, as I said in the beginning of my talk, um, to my knowledge, this is a unique occurrence in the Italian root territories. Um, one has to assume that this learning took place because of the close geographical proximity of German and Italian occupation authorities. No? Both powers had their headquarters in Tunis, uh, so the exchange was quite easily uh, to be arranged. Here too, um, it has um, to be seen as a voluntary borrowing from the Germans. There's again no indication whatsoever that the latter ones imposed direct pressure on its access partner in this regard. Rather, a critical rereading of the available sources suggests that the Italian authorities were even quite grateful uh, for German expertise and the willingness of its access partner to take the lead in matters of anti-Jewish repression, also when it came to the so-called Aryanization. Indeed, Italian authorities also agreed upon the systematic robbery of the Jews in Tunisia. Here too, there was some sort of access complicity. As we know from Rahn's official correspondence, not only the German Reich was to profit from Aryanization, also local Arab, French, and Italian families, which, uh, which had lost their property during Allied air raids on Tunis, were to be compensated with local Jewish household goods. This again was a practice developed in Europe more precisely in Germany. Its aim was uh, on the one hand to help families in need and at the same time tighten the bond between the regime and its people. Now I'm kind of involving people also in the crimes of the regime. And I think this shows us, and, and now I'm really at the end of my talk, and uh, we'll do a brief conclusion now, that the anti-Jewish policies before and during World War II cannot be adequately studied from a purely national perspective. Rather, we have to take into account the ways the Axis regimes mutually influenced and reinforced their respective racial agendas. Thank you. <laughs>